He founded uh, the Coffee Connection uh, in Massachusetts in 1974 and expanded that business to 24 locations uh, and was able to sell that business to Starbucks in 1994. 1996, he was awarded the SCAA Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, and you know, most, most people would sit on the wall at that point, right? You get a Lifetime Achievement Award. You're pretty much done, right? Uh, not this gentleman. Uh, at that point, he uh, founded something that I think everybody here knows about uh, and that has done great work uh, both for improving quality of coffee and uh, very importantly, improving the lives of the coffee farmers. Um, he also founded the Cup of Excellence program. Um, and then he still wasn't done. Um, he he uh, also created a new coffee company then in 2004, the George Howell Coffee Company, um, and introduced the Terroir uh, Coffee brand. Um, and so you can see throughout his career, um, he has never, never settled for um, the knowledge he already had. He's always sought more knowledge, learned more, and brought more knowledge to the greater coffee community. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. George Howe. Good evening. What, a, what an honor it is to be here. Um, let me get started right away with this. Um, I should have written, uh, I have come a long way, I'm on Bill Fishbein over there, uh, 1970s, that's when we got started. And really that's when specialty started as well. Um, back then it was uh, really, we were by ourselves. But uh, the one constant in specialty coffee from the 1970s to right now has been the generosity and mutual support of everybody involved from the start. It's really been a unique business to be in, and I could not have picked a better thing to do in my life than to be with the people that I've been with this entire time. So that has been great. Just very briefly, uh, the 1970s really was the Wild West. It was the beginning of specialty. Uh, Pete's had opened up in 1967, uh, or thereabouts, uh, Starbucks in 71, Coffee Connection in 74. Uh, we didn't even know we were going to roast. You know, I had traveled from the West Coast where I was a consumer of coffee, uh, and uh, come to the East Coast wanting some fresh, good coffee, and couldn't find a thing. We had a, uh, a wholesaler of what was called back then specialty coffee or gourmet coffee come to my home, which was a tiny little apartment with three bags of green coffee, a Colombian, a Central American, and a Brazil. Actually, it was a Central, yeah, that's right. And uh, he said, you know, mix this any way you want, and I uh, can produce Jamaican Blue Mountain, Kenya Double A, Ethiopian, or anything else you want, because it's strictly in the uh, imagination of the buyers that there's really no difference at all. <laughs> It was that that sent us to buy a roaster. Otherwise, really, I don't know what would have happened. Uh, so we got a ProBod, we, we opened up and, uh, in 1974. So we opened up in uh, April, and in August of 74, uh, it was the killer cross to Brazil. 50% uh, of Brazil's coffee trees died in a matter of three days flat. That meant 15% of the world's production was gone overnight. And uh, we watched the price, this is the green price of coffee go in a matter of a year and a half from 65 cents a pound to over $4 a pound. And that's in those prices back then. Think about what that would have been today. Uh, we went from selling, I have a photograph of that, not here, but uh, we were selling Hawaiian Kona in 1975 for $2.99 a pound. Right? Okay, so our cheapest coffee at the end of a year and a half was only ten dollars. Uh, we saw everybody disappear. We went from the most popular place in Harvard Square, and I really mean that, it was unbelievable. We were jammed with people right off the bat. No marketing study would have predicted it, to a ghost town a year later with nobody coming in. You know, maybe some drinks, but no beans at all. Uh, and but then 
uh, people started scratching back in larger and larger quantities. Uh, our prices came down to about eight or nine dollars a pound, multiples higher than what we had been at before. But people said, you know, we were paying high prices for the real cheap stuff and we couldn't live with it anymore. Uh, and so we've come back and we're willing to pay the price and we never look back. So um, that was an amazing moment. The uh, 1970s uh, then went into the 1980s, the early 80s. You saw flavored coffees come into the scene for the first time. Pretty much every, every uh, cafe and roastery around was doing flavored coffees. We never did. But that represented over 30% of their sales. And so uh, you really had to commit not to do it. But I hated the smell, I still do. That's how I never did it. Also, the one way about came in at that time. And then in the late 1980s, you had Starbucks and La Marzocca, uh, the amazing espresso machine, still amazing today. Uh, and Starbucks, which was then really a leader, and they truly did something uh, that changed the industry forever. They brought in the barista, they popularized the barista, really, uh, and they turned the espresso machine around to face the customer instead of away from it, and uh, put the barista in center stage, who was able to speak about the coffee somewhat. Uh, and, and, and produce a shot of espresso and do it pretty quickly uh, and professionally and, uh, and keep the line really moving. That was a major move. Uh, unfortunately, of course, these days they, uh, they abandoned it almost entirely. Uh, and uh, once McDonald got into the scene, because they saw how they were all automated, now the reason all he did was push a button, uh, you know, they've added a few special machines here and there, but for the most part, they're still push button. Um, in the 1990s, uh, Starbucks was everywhere, and as I like to say, darkness covered the land. <laughs> in the late 1990s, we had the first glimmerings of things to come. Uh, sustainability had become an issue. You had shade, grown, organic, it was really coming in, fair trade, and so on. Intelligentsia, Stumptown were getting started. And then in 1999, I co founded Cup of Excellence. And that really was a reaction to uh, two things that had happened the darkness of all the roasting. Uh, at that time, when I would go to uh, the countries of origin, even the cupping was in dark roast style. That was amazing. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, your mouth was just like milk bitterness, you know, and to do more than five coffees was too much. So, a uh, cup of excellence was an opportunity to bring back light roast in cupping and introduce people to it, and also to uh, give identity to farmers who were real craftspeople, who really cared about what they were doing, and put them center stage. Uh, get rid of the blends, or put them in the background, and, uh, and uh, make those people who make our lives possible, and our expression possible, make them partners with us, as opposed to just providers, uh, and anonymous ones in the shadows receiving, uh, you know, pennies when we made dollars. So, that was an amazing moment. So you have that in our own times, the rise of the state coffees in direct trade, slowly the lights get turned back on, light roast comes back, and you start what I call the Asian craftsmanship. Uh, from farms all the way to brewing, uh, along with the age of technology. Uh, of course, we have the espresso and the K-cup phenomenon, the capsules and the super convenience, the theme versus the substance but also really major brewing advances uh, in extraction with Extract Mojo, uh, the really amazing machines like Marzocco and other espresso folks, and, uh, and new technology on the way. And of course, uh, hand brewing uh, from the Chemex to the B60s and on and on. So we have seen an amazing acceleration in terms of quality and the variety of, of coffees and expressions that are being offered. Uh, I can't uh, think of any other way to express what's happening now than what is popularly called the third way. And I'd say, and I feel that I'm one of, one of you that way, even though I'm a lot older, uh, that we are really compulsive craftspeople. Uh, that's why most of us are doing this. Uh, and what we're, 
what is driving us. Uh, and I have to say, I am absolutely blown away uh, by the enthusiasm. Not in 1999, a cup of excellence, not in my wildest dreams that I think that there would be so many people, so many cafes, so many roasteries opening up, all talking much the same lingo as what I was talking, but not only that, but actually going far beyond me, all over the place, right, left, center, uh, and teaching me a great deal, as well as me being able to communicate back. So it's been an extraordinary experience. Uh, that was not what I felt in the 80s and 90s. I really felt like I was kind of solo, and very few people were picking up what I was talking about. That is far from the case today. So with that said, uh, by the way, I have to say, with uh, every quality advance that you've been making, and they've been huge and numerous, from packaging of coffee to green coffee, from country of origin to here, with the brain crow and the vacuum seal, and on and on. But with every quality advance we've made, it seems to me, five new challenges appear. This keeps happening. So, um, you know, keep going. There are going to be, I think, and this is what I've seen, one seeming brick wall after another that challenges us from perhaps profitability or getting the quality down the way we wanted it or getting the roast the way we wanted it or the drink the way we wanted it. Just keep plugging away and slowly uh, things uh, emerge and we learn something and we go on to the next. Uh, with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about exploring the flavors of coffee and uh, bring about the talk about the varieties of coffee and the concept of terroir. Much of which uh, a lot of this has been talked about in the last year or so. Uh, briefly, uh, you have the beginnings. Let me see if I have one question here. Yeah, the, the beginnings of uh, coffee uh, start the Arabica in the uh, southwestern Ethiopia, the mountains at five to six thousand feet. Uh, and I would say uh, throughout history and the coffee plant, whether it be Arabica or some other species of Cathaya, uh, has been used from time immemorial uh, to provide the caffeine. Uh, this could be uh, mashed, uh, the seeds simply mashed and put into uh, with, uh, with uh, fats, just fine meat, and so on, or some other way, and, uh, and taken that way in order to keep away or medicinally. Uh, it's not really until later uh, that you have Chinese fleets, which arrived in 1425, well before Columbus, uh, to, the, uh, to the shores of Yemen and Ethiopia. We're talking hundreds of ships that come in. This is a time when China is circumnavigating the globe and could have become the world power. Uh, a few years later, there would be an internal revolution in China against all the shipbuilding, against the massive deforestation that had taken place because of it. And China was never to sail the seas again, as it had once been doing. But they did arrive here, and they introduced the Yemenis and perhaps the Ethiopians to the social beverage tea, the caffeinated social beverage. And, uh, and when they disappeared five, six years later, I believe, and many others do, that the search for a social caffeinated beverage began. And clearly, the answer was coffee. So, if you go to Ethiopia today, you can have the coffee leaf brewed for you as a tea, although it has very little caffeine. You can have the dried husk brewed for you as well, also like an herbal tea, with salt added in Ethiopia. I didn't like it very much. Uh, it was not what I was expecting. Uh, so, uh, and then of course, uh, the, uh, the coffee bean itself. And uh, they're both roasted in Ethiopia on what looks like pan, like, like for tea, pan fire, essentially, is the way they're doing this. And uh, by the way, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia and the first places that drank coffee, they barely roasted the coffee at all. I mean, do you most people think that the Norwegians roast slightly? The Saudis get it so that it's still is good, right? And it's, so it's made like a tea. Uh, literally, you can see right through it. And uh, they will add uh, different spices and such to that drink. And that's how coffee really begins. So when that happens, 
uh, coffee is moved from the forest, where coffee is part of the underforest, it moves to the dry, very dry mountains of eastern Ethiopia, Harar, and across the Red Sea to the mountains of, of Yemen. Uh, and uh, this is where it is first commercially grown on a large scale. Here, there is very little rainfall. Yemen receives a fraction of what it what it normally would to to, to sustain coffee production. Uh, it's with the terraces that they have, and the uh, and uh, that keeps the rainfall there, if you will, and the streams, the mountains, that they are able to grow to grow coffee at all. And you see this also in Harar. So. That's the first move, and this happens right around 1425, not that long ago. So, all this coffee starts to get exported, ported out of a port called al Muka in Yemen. Uh, first to the capitals of the Middle East, and then to the rest of Europe, who then come to know this exotic drink uh, coming from al Muka, and the word slowly transforms into mocha. And so that's how we refer to mocha from Yemen, uh, or Eastern Ethiopia. Uh, mocha would later come to mean chocolate and, and coffee due to a French pastry chef, who I believe in the 18th century puts the two together in a cake and calls it mocha. So that's the beginning. Um, so from Ethiopia you go to Yemen and spreads throughout the Middle East. Uh, and then the Europeans pick up on it, but not before uh, a, an Indian Muslim saint, Baba Budan, takes a handful of plants, takes it to the Malabar coast, the western coast of India, and starts growing plants there. He is a saint now in India. You find a shrine up there in the mountains. It's quite amazing to, to visit. Uh, and the Dutch are able to take literally three or four plants and take that to Indo uh, Indonesia. Uh, to the islands of Java and uh, later to Sumatra. And uh, there they start to grow it. Now, the Arabica plant, the species of Arabica, is uh, uh, self pollinating. There is no need for male female. Uh, so, in essence, one tree can produce millions and beyond uh, all by itself. So with that handful, the first variety is really born. In other words, they select a particular tree with particular aspects, and they start to grow that one tree over and over again, almost like a clone, if you will. And this becomes the Kika variety, if you will. And that is then taken to the greenhouses of Europe, Amsterdam, and then Paris. And then one single plant, as many of you probably know, makes it to Martinique. Uh, just one, and from there millions of plants spread throughout the Americas, and that is your first variety, Pibica. The second variety is Bourbon, and that happens just a few years later, uh, right around uh, 1700, and uh, this is the French who take it there, the island is now called Réunion, and in the 19th century, that plant will be taken to Brazil and spread throughout the Americas. The Bourbon rapidly overtakes Tipica because it is 30% more productive. And uh, so this is a, a major consequence, commercially speaking. So it takes over and Tipica becomes the minority plant, if you will. And then, Bourbon also makes it to the coast of Kenya, Tanzania, uh, and it will develop later into SL28 and 34 and other varieties in Eastern Africa. So you have two parent varieties, Tipica and Bourbon. One with a uh, round shape, the Bourbon and Tipica more elongated uh, and slightly larger. Bourbon having generally giving you a creamier texture type coffee, if you will. Tipica that is uh, can be a slightly more floral and lighter, uh, but it has to be grown in just the right places to do that. So going back for a second, the beginning you have the Ethiopian Arabica landless. Ethiopia does not have varieties of coffee. Every plant is slightly different. There are, if people talk about varieties, they'll talk about a hundred different varieties. They're only just starting with really what are called selections. 
before you even get the varieties. So these are the land races. And all these plants come from a wet forest zone. Then you go to East Ethiopia, Harar, and Yemen, very dry. And this stays that way, these plants stay that way for the next 100 to 200 years. And it is those plants that have stayed in the dry areas that then get taken to Asia, to the Tipica, and to the East Africa with the Bourbon, wetter climates, and then off to the Americas. And so now you have plants that are no longer disease resistant as they once were in the forests of Ethiopia. They have lost their resistance. And these are what now populate the Americas. And of course, we all are now hearing about Froya, uh, rust that is attacking these plants, and, uh, and many other fungi as well coming in. So, and from the Americas, you now have cultivars that basically all come from these two varieties, Tipica and Bourbon. So an amazingly narrow genetic funnel happens here and then spreads back out again. And of course we have one exception, the geisha, which happened. Geisha was brought in somewhere around the 1930s, made it to Central America, and it was brought in because it came from the forests of Ethiopia, and therefore it was much more disease resistant to things like rust. However, it was a very low producer, and so they gave up on it. And so Geisha remained, but sort of like little puddles after a rain. No one took care of them, no one cared about it, until La Esmeralda in 2004 picked up on the fact that this was a rather unique tasting coffee, separated it from everything else, presented it in the competition with the best of Panama, and the covers there absolutely blew their minds, and the rest is history. So we start again with Tipica and Bourbon, and you get spontaneous mutations that naturally take place. For instance, in Brazil, in a county called Maragogipe, uh, suddenly a plant appears in, in a whole field of Tipica, which is double the size, huge leaves, huge fruit, uh, fruit and coffee beans inside, and this is now called the Maragogia plant. And so they separate that plant out, start to grow it, and you have the beginnings of Maragogia. Likewise, you get Gormonovo, a more uh, powerful, more vital plant uh, than the Tipica, but very similar to it in flavor notes. And the Bourbon produces Katura, a dwarf uh, in size, but very capable of producing a lot of coffee if properly given enough nutrition. And then Pacas is another type of semi-dwarf. And from there, you get, and this, by the way, is an example of that, this is a whole uh, range from down below of uh, Katuras, and then the parental variety stuff that popped up, and there you have in the middle of it uh, a uh, Bourbon tree. And you can see right away the huge difference between those two plants. The, the tall Bourbon is spindly, uh, less of a producer, and down below is the Katura. It will grow to be the same size over a much longer time uh, as the uh, as the Bourbon, but in that bushy state, if you have the resources as a farmer to put lots of nutrition in and so on, it will produce much more for you. And then you get crosses where you start to mix, let's say, Momonovo with Datura to get Katuai, Maragogipa with Pacas to get Pacamara, and so on down the line until you have now dozens and dozens of cultivars from the Americas and elsewhere. So that's a little bit about varieties. And now, to go on, it has to be said that varieties are only as good as terroir and craftsmanship really allow them to be. Put simply, what terroir is, is a taste and place. Uh, there is really no simpler way to say it. It is a French term that was applied first to wine, but today, especially in Europe, it's being applied to everything. From olive oil to cheeses to just about every agricultural product. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it's now being applied to coffee as well. It's primarily about the soil, the minerals, the drainage, retention, fertility, fertilization, the pH factor, all of these things go into doing it. In fact, in Burgundy, the soils are actually uh, captured down below at the bottom of the slopes and returned up to the slopes each year. 
to give you an idea of how important terroir is uh, in, the, uh, in some areas of the wine industry. Other components of terroir, though, are clearly the microclimate, the exposition of the facing south, north, which way, which way do the winds come, are they cold, are they warm or wet or dry, uh, what other plants are around them, the age of the tree, the roots, the topography of the area, the altitude, and so on. Uh, it was said about a year ago or so that um, it was all about variety and not really about where it's grown. And I really couldn't disagree more with that, with that idea. Where it's grown is easily as important as the variety. They're both important. But to take an example, Guatemala is an extraordinary country. Uh, you see it here, uh, the really mountainous area is Guatemala. And then as you stand further south, you get Salvador and, uh, and Honduras. And you can see how the density of the mountains and the complexity of the terrain start to open up and simplify as you go uh, further west uh, towards those countries. So the diversity and microclimates in Guatemala are absolutely extraordinary, very, very numerous. Just to give you a simple example of that, uh, this is like Atitlan, and uh, you have, where we were getting last year, two different farms. One, El Rajal, which grew in this canyon down here. So you literally, I'm taking this photograph at 8,000 feet, and you're dropping down into the canyon to get to that farm. And we were getting another farm, uh, just oops, for some reason that didn't appear. There we go, from San Pate, which was a thousand feet over Lake Atitlan, which is at five thousand feet, so six thousand feet in altitude, both farms, but entirely different environments, and yet just a few miles away from each other as the crow flies. So if you go down into that canyon, as you see here, you you come to this area where the mountains down, and then you get this kind of like shelf at 6,000 feet. Uh, an entirely different environment here. You can't see the lake anymore. Uh, you get the uh, currents of air going from the Pacific and from the mountains uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the east. And uh, a, an entirely different microclimate and soil here than the one alongside the lake, just a few miles away. And the flavors are subtly different from each other as well. The expression of terroir really requires a partnership between the grower and the processor who washes the coffee and dries it, the roaster, and then finally the brewer. And terroir is really very subtle and complex. Its variety can give you, the varieties can give you really unique flavors, especially when you think about something like vacation which has this massive apricot and sweet lemon notes and so on. Very clear cut. But um, things like Katura, Bourbon, Tipica are much more subtle than that. And they can capture other flavors. There's a web of flavors that are subtle and give a coffee complexity. And it's, it's also coffee where too much power, amplification can actually distort those flavor notes and create a wall, a single block in your mouth uh, that does not allow you to taste what I call layer transparencies uh, that you can move through if the coffee is at the right strength and roast it the right way. Um, so, as I was saying, for instance, ideally, and this is considered in wine as well, it's more neutral type varieties that do best with terroir because they have more transparency. The Tipica is one, Bourbon is another. They have differences, but they're not big differences like the Geisha or an SL28 for that matter. They don't have that unique flavor that's coming with them. They have somewhat different notes, if you will, or characters to them. And the Datura, which is not an inferior variety to the Bourbon or the Tipica. And it is simply proved by the amazing copies uh, that come from Colombia sometimes that are 100% Tatura and that are extraordinarily floral in their own very special way, very different from the Ethiopians uh, with 
would certainly uh, note uh, that I, I detect them not on tropical fruit, fruit, but also a wintergreen note to certain Colombian coffees. Utterly unique. And this is the Katura that produces this. So it's a great variety. Um, these are the types of varieties that really give you very clear cut. It's all done right, in the right place, with the right conditions, and so on. A sense of terroir. That, as opposed to powerfully flavored varieties, and the most obvious example, as I've been saying, is the geisha. This is not to take away anything from the geisha. It is rather to give back more to the other varieties and put them on an equal footing with the geisha. Um, I think we all, and I have done this numerous times, when we discover something utterly different and utterly unique, we really focus on that. And that becomes our primary interest for a while as we come to absorb that in our knowledge base. But over time, we come to realize it's one flower among many extraordinary flowers. It is not greater than the others. It is just another expression uh, to be appreciated. So, what obscures terroir? What's this thing about power that I'm talking about? Uh, an example of that in wine is too much oak. Uh, Americans really went into heavy oak wines 10, 20 years ago. Uh, today, that's vanishing. Uh, but these were the first flavors that people were noticing. In coffee, I suggest that natural and honey coffees uh, have played much the same role. And that is not to say that they're wrong or that they shouldn't exist. Just like oat wine is still there and in the right proportions produces not only good wine, but some of the greatest wines on earth. Uh, so this is not a denial of one thing or another. It's a matter of talking about balance and subtlety with naturals, with honey, or washed. But if they're really purely that, then they can be overpowered. So, a little bit further, the most interesting part of where terroir comes from is the intrinsic development of the coffee bean, the seed itself. Not the same thing as the flavor notes that can be added by what happens on the outside as the fruit dries around the coffee bean and affects the flavor of the bean inside. The bean absorbs flavors from the fruit as that fruit in a natural process or a honey process is absorbed in. The fruit starts to dry up, goes into a raisin stage, microorganisms attack it, uh, the cracks in the, in the fruit, and you have a kind of runaway fermentation and yeast that is taking place. And you get wild fruit notes that take place in both the natural and the, the, um, the honey type coffees, especially in, in humid areas. This is very similar. So essentially, in the, uh, in the natural and in the uh, honey, you do have some flavoring that happens outside. And that one I'm going to particularly bad mood, I talk about, well, that's flavored coffee. But that's not very fair. Um, Fruitiness from fermentation is a controversial topic in coffee, but it's very similar to the role that something in wine plays called bread damomyces, which is a yeast uh, that, that takes place in wines. Uh, when uh, barrels uh, where wine is kept and other instruments are not perfectly, perfectly clean, uh, they produce these microorganisms and they produce what people will call barnyard notes in wine. And in minute amounts, it's very pleasant. But when it becomes too strong, it literally smells and tastes, and there's no other word for it like shit. <laughs> so, just like fruit, when it becomes overwhelming in a natural, it can taste really raw. So, it's really a matter for everyone to decide, for the consumer, for the roaster, for all of us to decide where is the right proportion and the right strength. And we're all going to find a different point. When I give people, uh, consumers, we have these, these uh, open houses where we have 50 people, consumers come in at a time and we have them taste a natural from Ethiopia washed from Ergachef and a wash from Ergachef side by side. And we ask them, which do you prefer? And we have a 50-50 split. 
And, but it's rad. The people who really like the natural love it. The people who really like the wash hate the natural and love the other. So it's, it's, it's two different worlds in there. And uh, that's the way it's going to go for a long time to come. So back to terroir, each terroir, this is a quote. Each terroir should be allowed to be itself and produce wine for which nature endowed it. The winemaker's signature, the vinification style, is permissible so long as it does not substitute for terroir. This is the ideal that the French have set up uh, for terroir regarding wine. And uh, I think when we go to great Guatemalans and such, we may be looking for that as well. The roaster's task in this becomes developing the coffee as fully as possible while maintaining the balance of acidity and body, keeping that acidity, which is the carrier of the fruit notes uh, and the aromatics that are taking place, the floral notes, and ideally to maintain a transparency with little to no overlay of caramel, which I compare to a sauce. Okay, you know, the dark roasters, it's lots of ketchup. And on more ketchup, you don't like the roast or whatever, what do we do? We make the roast darker, and on the ketchup, it overflows and, and completely wipes out what we might not like in the flavor of the coffee itself. But when you have a great coffee, as most of us here do now, we roast lightly in order to capture that intrinsic flavor note that is so extraordinary and so unique in that particular coffee. And that involves, then, for the brewer, the correct extraction and the right power to it. Uh, and I would say there that we have to be careful not to overpower. Well, with the coffee, we serve both ourselves and our customers. Sometimes, for instance, an espresso that is made uh, at 18, 21 grams to make a single espresso, let alone a double, uh, the Italians have really reacted to this. They love the, the original 13 to 14 grams. They think it's too powerful. There have been lots of espressos that I've come to love at 18 and 21 grams. They're very powerful. They can be very sweet. But it is worth exploring the 13, 14 gram espresso as well. Uh, you can enter it more easily. It is softer. It is something you can you can pick up more layers of flavor and potentially greater subtleties. I would advise experiment with it. See what it's like. You might serve classical espressos at that point as well as the more modern type espressos. The same way with um, with brewing drip coffee. Um, you know, 1.5% soluble solids, that's 98.5% water is a strong drip coffee. 98.8% water is a really mild coffee. Just that slight difference makes a radical difference in flavor. At the milder flavors, there are, you do not, you actually are able to pick up as this coffee starts to cool. Flavor notes, floral notes, and changes that are quite subtle and really uh, very beautiful to, to notice the changes that they go through. So I just recommend experimenting with that a little bit, uh, especially when you get the chance for the 30-minute uh, pleasure trip. Uh, right? Because that's what you pick up on. Right? Uh, this is what I do in the mornings. Every morning I wake up, maybe 6.30, whatever. I don't have breakfast or anything. I make myself a pot of coffee identically. I make it at uh, 1.2 to 1.25 uh, uh, extraction. That's it. Strength. Very mild uh, for most people. And at first, it may seem watery, but uh, then as it starts to cool, I'm getting all kinds of amazing flavors to it. And it does. It takes me 20 to 30 minutes. The coffee really cools to room temperature, and uh, I judge it throughout that time. Sometimes, I'm absolutely thrilled. Like Matt and Ronald, our, our key roasters, and, and are overjoyed to get my, my email and phone call. And other times, I'm going, oh, this is over or that's wrong, or the aftertaste is wrong, and every day is different that way. But for me, it's a ritual. And um, so what you have is 
you can have a coffee that when it's really hot, you can smell it and you start to taste it, then it can be harsh. And then as it starts to cool, it becomes very sweet and you pick up these amazing floral and fruit notes. And then you get an aftertaste afterwards that goes back to leaving a kind of roasty note or a cereal note in your mouth. And uh, so it's there, but not perfectly so. And I have yet to run into a roaster in this country or any other country who doesn't have this problem. There are roasts that I get from some competitor in New York or elsewhere, and I go, oh my God, they're way ahead of us. And I want to pull my hair out because this is the most amazing coffee. And then I get the same coffee from that roaster a month later, and they're screwing up just like I did the month before. <laughs> so I find this again and again. We really know very little about roasting stuff on that day. Uh, and uh, we're all learning. The, the, the understanding of how to roast coffee in my mind really has a long ways to go, but we're on our way and it has become far better and far more after. Then again, what you're really looking for, and I do get it in my cups from time to time, in fact I had it today in that with Elmer Hell, wherever you are there, uh, but you roasted on Wednesday and it was like that. Sweet, but hot, but solidful, and wow, that was an amazing experience. So, to your next great cup, and I thank you very much.